In this video, I'm going to talk about tone mapping or color management as we have it called in Blender. I briefly touched upon this topic in the previous uh, chapter where we talked about rendering, but now let's get into it. So as you can see, I'm in the compositing tab here. Let's click use nodes, remove the render layers, and let's import our 32-bit image we have created in the previous video. So I'm choosing it here, connecting with the composite output node and also creating the viewer node so we can preview the image in the back. I'm going to press V to zoom it out a little bit and Alt middle mouse button to pan it yeah, and make it center. So what do we use tone mapping or color management for? Well, basically this settings here enable us to do the very basic post-production on the image. So let's start with the looks. We have multiple options to choose from. As you can see, when I change the contrast settings here, the image look also changes. Uh, we are able to influence the gamma settings where in general we can use gamma for a decreasing or increasing contrast within the picture as well and exposure uh, is responsible for the amount of light we have in the image so it basically multiplies the pixel values uh, within our static to the image cool thing as i mentioned in the previous video with 32-bit images is where we go down with the exposure, we still get those uh, light information here. If we go up, uh, again, the shadow information here is very detailed. And that's basically it, I would say, as for the uh, color management. Uh, what's important here is understanding the filmic and different uh, inputs from within this section. To avoid technical talk, you just have to understand Blender is an animation software at its core. So a lot of inputs you'll find in it uh, will be film related. But for us, people doing the architectural visualization, uh, we can just at least here stick to the defaults or to the filmic. The filmic is a color management input that kind of tries to make uh, the tones uniform, so it prevents us from having the overburned values here, as well as having the flat dark uh, values within the shadows, within the dark colors in our image. Filmic also tends to give a little bit more natural image look, even if we change the contrast to very high, it still preserves the values within um, the highly contrasted tone areas. Whereas if we choose the default look, um, as you can see, it creates those overburned areas and we would have to adjust the gamma and exposure settings to get rid of them. Um, as you can see, it slows down blenders quite a bit, but yeah. Uh, in general, also, if you use the default values, if we set up gamma to 2.2, uh, this more or less gives us the tone balance as with the filmic uh, setup. The difference is still we have to pay much more attention into those highlights and shadows uh, in order to avoid the overburned areas like, let's say, this one we have here right now. So... Uh, if I switch back to Filmic, this won't be happening as you can see. Uh, color management and tone mapping is not only about setting up the different looks here and having a ready to go result by default from Blender. It actually allows us matching the rendering output to the referenced image. And I would like to show you how we can do this in the next video. To start the tone matching of our rendered image to the reference, we have to modify our viewport a little bit. So I'm dividing this bottom area 
into two independent ones and choosing image editors in each one of them. Here, I'm gonna choose the viewer node, which is this viewer from the compositing editor. And here I'm gonna open our main reference. So this is the setup uh, we are gonna be using for tone mapping for color uh, matching those two pictures. Within each of the image editors, I'm gonna press the N key and now I'm gonna choose the scopes. So this gives us a little bit more technical input on the images and the histogram gives us an information about the color distribution in each one of them. Let's switch to Luma. And right now we know uh, what are the tone representations or the tone spread within the images. So the left part of the histogram are 100% blacks. The right part of the histogram are 100% whites. The middle ground is the 50% gray. So you can see in the original reference, we have much more tones in this right section of the histogram. So between 50% gray and 100% white. Whereas in our rendering, everything is a little bit uh, in the middle. So here on the left, we have more or less the same amount of tones as on the right. Now the tone mapping or color matching of those two images would be basically making this histogram look more like that one. We won't be able to get them identical, obviously, because our rendering is a little bit different to the source image, but still, I think we are able to reproduce the general shape of this histogram, or at least move the values from the middle to the right as we have here. Having most of the tones centered around this area means we'll have a lot of gray values around our image. So if we increase the contrast, that should spread the histogram evenly into both uh, ends. But I personally don't like using those high contrast settings. As you can see, they make the image a little bit too overburned. So let's stick to the medium high contrast maybe. And as I mentioned in one of the previous videos, we can also control the contrast using the gamma settings. So let's divide it by half and see what's happening. You can see the histogram move totally to the left. So it's still not what we are aiming at. Let's use the values of 1.5 to see if there is any difference. Now we have the histogram on the right, but the values are too bright as for my taste. So let's go back to the defaults and let's see what happens if we play around with the exposure. If we go to minus one, again, the histogram moves to the left, meaning if we go up with the values, it will move to the right. So let's perhaps start with the exposure settings. Uh, we've moved some of the values to the right and let's now decrease the gamma and try to spread the histogram in this area. I think, I think this might do the trick just a little bit. Yeah, you can see if we increase the gamma very, very slightly, uh, we are getting quite a similar shape, even uh, those areas here. Perhaps this is a little bit too high as for now, but let's see. Let's look at the image itself. I think it also looks pretty good. Obviously we have too much light in those areas. So let's try to reduce it. Let's maybe go with 1.25 gamma here. Uh, sorry, exposure. And yeah, that actually gives us a pretty good starting point. Um, as for the tone mapping, I would say that's basically it and that's that's all you can do just within those very basic settings. However, we can influence the histogram look a little bit more in detail and that's where the curves come into play. You can see they are hidden under this little icon here. Let's hit the use curves button and you can see we have a grid pattern within this window and within the histograms. So the point 
I'm going to add here will be represented here in the histograms. You can actually see uh, the very middle point of this histogram has those white values already uh, marked, whereas here we have those values much lower. So let's see what happens if we move this point towards down. Yeah, so that influenced our histogram, unfortunately not in the way we want it. So here, if you play around with the curves, that's a little bit more spontaneous than the settings we were setting up here. You sometimes need to add a few more points like those two. I usually keep, yeah, thanks Blender. I usually just keep those three points within my curve editor and try manipulate them only and make this graph look a little bit more like that one. You can also use these two icons to zoom in, zoom out, to make a more, uh, to have a better precision while editing the curves because as you can see, those very slight changes we do, they can influence the histogram quite drastically. Let's say if I move this point here, you can see the histogram spread Again, if I move it upwards, just within those very tiny values, yeah, it now gets a little bit more like that. So I think this is more or less the look we are trying to get. Again, you still have to observe the main image every single time because what we are actually planning to have is a nice image, not a nice looking histogram. The, the histogram is here just to help us matching the tones, but still the image is our main target, the good looking image. So I'm going to play a little bit with the curves here and get back to you once they are done. And I'm back again after finishing my curve editing. Let me just increase this area slightly so we have a better preview. As you can see, our histogram now looks quite similar to what we have in the original image. And as you can see, I also added two extra points uh, around the ends of the curve. Let me show you what happens if I edit this point. So if I move it around, it changes the look of the image quite drastically. So you have to be careful about it. Um, but it basically adjusts the darker tones of our pictures. So you can see this part of the histogram stays mostly untouched if I just move this point around. And the other point on the other edge, or sorry, on the other end of the curve will be doing exactly the same. Uh, the difference is it only impacts the highlights. So if I move it a little bit down, you can see only this part of the histogram changes. So in the end, as I mentioned, we still have to look at the main picture and see if we like it or not. As for our example, I think we have a little bit too dark shadowy area. So let's move this point up. And yeah, this is more or less what we call tone mapping color matching uh, for the images. Let me hide the histograms here and let's now zoom in to both of the inputs. I think we are getting pretty similar results. Still, there is a difference in color. As you can see, this one is a little bit more, gr more greeny or bluish, depending on your, the monitor you have. But as the tones if you can see this shadowy area and this one in comparison to those areas, I think we are getting pretty similar matches. Same here. Here we obviously have a little bit more shadow than in our example, so that's why it's darker. But let's say this area and this area, they look quite similar to my taste. Um, as well as here, perhaps we could get a little bit more shadow. But yeah, that's not always possible, unfortunately. Um, in any case, I think those two images look now quite similar before we applied the tone mapping. 
And you can also see that if we compare the images directly. So this is the original input without any changes. And this is our result after applying the tone mapping. So I think uh, this input is way better. To be honest with you, when I do the Photoshop post-production, I still prefer to use the normal default uh, filmic look from here. Sometimes I just uh, change the uh, contrast. So this will be my input for Photoshop editing. But as for the Blender post-production, this is the image we will now start to color correct, adjust the shades um, and see how far we can go with it. Thank you guys for watching. This video is part of my interior visualization course in Blender, which you can watch for free on YouTube. All the necessary details and link to the full playlist can be found in the video description. If you want to support what I do and access all of the 3D files used in this course, plus Blender ready interior setups and over 2000 Blender exclusive 3D models, just visit the Chocofruit store and learn more about our subscription plans. Again, thanks for watching and I see you soon.